teach in the economics department and it's my pleasure to uh, um, uh, join you all today for this uh, open forum discussion on predatory lending. I'm going to say a few words about the context of this discussion, the class that I'm teaching and then I'm going to invite my students to um, open up the, the forum uh, and lead uh, the rest of the discussion. So this semester I'm teaching a class, it's an upper level seminar in economics called monetary theory and one of the things that I've been uh, discussing over the years in this class is the linkages between inequality, economic inequality, and financial instability at the macro level. And after several years of doing this and engaging with community organizations here uh, in Licking County, it just became more and more evident. I mean, the bits and pieces started to become crystal clear, at least in my mind, and the invisible, what used to be invisible connections became more visible. And, and that's kind of the context in which I invited my students to explore this particular uh, issue. And this semester, with um, thanks to a, uh, a grant from Ohio Campus Compact, um, yes, thank you, uh, the class is partnering with the Newark Think Tank on Poverty, which is a local community organization. I'll let uh, Alan and the rest of the Newark Think Tank team later uh, say a little bit more about the Think Tank. So we're partnering in this uh, research project, joint research project, to investigate um, some of the predatory lending schemes that, um, that we have here in Ohio, in our, in our community. And it's not just a local problem. This is a national issue, right? And the idea is to um, finish the semester with uh, a product, the final product, which would be uh, a policy report that highlights the issues, uh, explains why those are important issues, and lays out uh, a set of policy solutions, some proposals, that we can take to, uh, number one, educate the community about these issues, number two, uh, speak to policymakers uh, about uh, what can be done. And uh, as we speak, there is a, a House bill uh, in the Ohio um, uh, uh, legislator, HB 123, um, that's sort of attempting to, to do this, cracking down on predatory lending. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll just leave it at that for now, and I'll invite um, my students to introduce themselves and introduce us to some of these issues that, uh, that we have to, to tackle, uh, and, and lead the conversation with, uh, with, the, with everybody in this, um, in this forum. There are microphones across uh, different tables, so feel free to turn it on and engage when, when it's time for Q&A. We have extra microphones, um, uh, and we're using the microphones primarily for, for the camera, so please use the mics. So with that, um, I'll invite uh, Zakia, Brett, and Kevin to lead the conversation. Uh, I'm Brett White. I'm a junior and an economics and computer science double major. So I'll start off by sharing some statistics about the un unbanked and underbanked population. And so uh, the FD FDIC released some data in 2014 saying that 28% of Americans are either unbanked or underbanked. That is roughly 93 million people. And uh, there's definitions of unbanked and underbanked. Can you speak up a little bit? Yeah, sorry. Um, So these people, um, they are excluded from orthodox financial institutions, which means that they must rely on uh, alternative financial services and pay yearly for these services. So the average income of under uh, banked households in 2012 was $25,500. On average, $2,500 was spent solely on interest and fees for these alternative financial services, such as payday loans. 
And as you can see, that's 10% of their annual income. And that is about the same amount that they would pay for or spend on food for the, the year. Hi, I'm Kevin Benson. I'm a senior uh, majoring in computer science and minoring in economics. Um, I'd like to share some statistics about payday lending, um, specifically in Ohio. Uh, so Ohio is, in terms of uh, maximum observed interest rates, the worst state in the country for payday borrower borrowers. Um, some payday lenders uh, charge interest rates up to 591%. Um, this is the case despite the existence of a nominal uh, payday lender interest rate cap, which attempted to rein in the exorbitant interest rates that could be charged by uh, payday lenders. Um, payday lenders instead have managed to get around this uh, barrier by reclassifying themselves as second mortgage lenders and then have the ability to charge interest rates up to 591%. Um, there exist over 650 of these payday lenders or second mortgage rate lenders in Ohio. Um, the average cost to borrow $300 for five months from a payday lender in the state of Ohio was $680 um, compared to a state elsewhere in the country, for example, Colorado. It had only cost $172 to do so. Um, it's pretty uh, clear to see how these kind of interest rates could lead to a he healthy stream of income for payday lenders who in Ohio collect nearly $200,000 of interest per day. And they've used some of these proceeds to um, pretty consistently lobby uh, Ohio um, state and national representatives uh, where uh, um, payday lobbyists have spent one and a half million dollars exclusively on Ohio campaign donations since 1995. Hi, um, excuse me. Um, I'm Zakia, I'm a senior and I'm a psych and econ double major. Um, I'm going to just talk about why people borrow payday loans um, and like who um, payday, predatory lending is like targeted to. Um, so what payday or predatory lending is basically um, if you need money you can quickly get it um, um, without any kind of like issues like borrowing from banks is sometimes um, a lot of banks don't give out loans. So these are usually um, targeted towards minorities, um, the poor and um, elderly and also the less educated because um, there are a lot of disadvantages when um, borrowing predatory or payday loans. Um, and that's because of the high interest rates, um, as they've mentioned. Um, so again, it's people who doesn't have access to traditional banks. Um, and also, they, if they have bad credit, um, they, they can't get loans from the banks. And um, also, for people who may run into any kind of emergencies, um, a lot of low-income people, they don't earn um, enough money or income in order for those emergencies. So they get into this bad cycle of um, going to these places. So a lot of the arguments is like, why do people like keep borrowing this money, or why do we have still this predatory lending system. I just found out apparently there are more um, predatory lending places than McDonald's. And I was pretty surprised when I found that out. So um, I'm just going to look at the statistics here about um, the Licking County minimum um, living wage. So as you can see, um, the living in order for a living wage for one adult and 20, um, I mean two children is $26. But the minimum wage for like all these like families it's just 8.30. I, I think it's 8.10 in Ohio. Yeah. Um, so the poverty wage is $9 for one adult, two children. Um, so in order for them to earn this money, um, like the living cost, this kind of shows the living cost for each family. Um, in order for them to like support um, the children and the housing, food and other um, necessary um, things, they would need to earn, again, I'm only looking at the one adult and two, two children, um, income after taxes, they would need to earn 47, almost $50,000 in order to survive. So a lot of families do not necessarily need that goal. And it kind of tells you how difficult it is for um, these families 
um, <clears throat> to survive. And that's why they kind of fall into that schema of like borrowing money. So if they run into like, a, if their car breaks down of have, or if they have any medical emergency, they have to go to these places and um, they don't think about the high interest rates because they have to, you know, live, live paycheck to paycheck. So this kind of sums up why these places still exist. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, my work with um, New York Think Tank Poverty. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with this organization last semester when I took a course with um, Dr. Kapu. Um, what New York Think Tank Poverty um, does is um, they've uh, worked with the local community members that have been, or, or the returning citizens that have been um, not privileged enough to find jobs or have difficulty finding jobs. They also educate them about the opportunities um, they may not be aware of. So when I was working with them, um, one thing I really learned is um, the so many things that we as students um, take as like a privilege, you know, just what gentrification is, you know, like understanding things like that. A lot of the community members are not aware of it, even though they're experiencing things like that. So um, our class last um, year were able to do a presentation about gentrification. And we were so like thankful because of how much they appreciated you know, what we were able to teach them. So this is what um, New York State Time Poverty works on, is educate them about mental health and other things. Um, and also, if you I don't know if you're familiar with um, the Up River, it talks about how they've been involved with Man the Box for returning citizen. That's one of the big things they're also very part of. Um, so yeah, I'm going to have Alan and Alicia introduce. And if you guys have any questions, yeah. Uh, you don't get Alicia. You only get me. Um, Got to wait for the next event to get Alicia. OK, so I'm Alan Schwartz. I'm one of the founders of the, uh, of the New York Think Tank on Poverty. And I just have three things I wanted to, to mention to y'all. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you for having us do this. It's really important. Uh, I'm glad that Sakia mentioned last year. We work with a, quite a few Denison students. Um, and the team last year did this project for us on gentrification, which gave that to us as a tool. It's a giant secret right now in Newark what this tool, this conceptual tool called gentrification, which is the other side of the coin from economic development. But nobody's talking about it. We talk about little things like the gazebo missing, but nobody has that conceptual tool. So it was such a good thing for the Denison students to help us nail down that conceptual tool and, and we really look forward to continuing to work on these kinds of projects. It helps us, helps them. And the way that it helps them, this is the first thing I wanted to mention, is the reason why the Think Tank was uh, put together four years ago is to change things and one of the first steps in, in changing things is to make the invisible visible. Right? Um, probably two-thirds of the people here I know Right? And I've heard these kinds of presentations before, but I really want to say something to the one-third of the people and the students here who I don't know. Thank you for coming to something that you don't exactly know what it is, but your curiosity, or your teacher who told you to be here, um, is making you say, I want to see this. Right? So there is a part of your world which is made invisible. And I'm not just talking about the financial world, which is made invisible to all of us, hard to figure out. We get lawyers, we get financial consultants to figure out the legality of things. If you're in the middle class, of course, if you're in the working class, you don't have those resources, right? So the financial world makes itself invisible, but I'm talking about another world, right? As Zakiya was saying, the 30 to 50% of people who live in Licking County who are at or near poverty. And so not only is that large number of people invisible to us, we keep them tucked away far from Granville, um, but their experience is invisible to us. We can't taste it. We don't know what it's like. Uh, 
And that's really important and important for us in the middle class to realize that that part of our world is missing. That we have our private promised land kind of set out for us and if we want to really know what the world is like, we have to step out of our private promised land. And we invite you all to work with us in Newark to do that. Uh, it will really blow your mind. It will, your assumptions about the world, I was just talking to Chuck about my, my control fantasies, right? I, I have the belief as a middle class person that I can control planning, if you don't plan to fail, whatever that thing is, right? That I can plan and succeed, but that doesn't represent the chaos and unpredictability of people's lives who don't have the tools that I have. So I'm appealing to your intellectual honesty, your intellectual integrity to say, I don't know about this part of the world. I better find out. Right? And that's why the think tank is here. And once you find out, you'll become our ally, and we will change the conditions under which people live. So the think tank is here to make the invisible visible. Second thing I wanted to say is, here's something we don't talk about much. I, I do in my classes at CTEC, but what are your expectations of a system that works? 30 to 50% of a county in poverty? One out of five children hungry every night? One out of six people in Ohio have a felony conviction. Are these your expectation of a, of a system that works? I don't think so. So we tell ourselves this lie by making things invisible that the system is working when it really violates our own expectations of what a system really needs to do to work. And I want you to honor your expectations and not set them aside. And change the world so that it matches your legitimate expectations of a system that works. Last thing I want to say is something about class privilege, which is another one of those concepts that we use clumsily, if at all. So I just want to say, you're going to hear four testimonies of stories, as that's the other side of the coin from these wonderful statistics, and we want to get both parts of that experience together, right? Dr. Weinberg has been talking a lot about getting the campus off hill, downhill, into Newark, so that we can join this academic knowledge with actual experience. So you can hear about that, but don't be fooled because it's only four stories and that's all it is. It's 30 to 50% of Licking County and millions and millions and millions and millions of people. So that violates, the fact that I don't know about that as well as I should, violates my sense of intellectual integrity. And I hope here in the Liberal Arts College it does that for you as well. So we have class privilege, right? So if I get in a jam, um, if there's a, an emergency, I have the resilience to get over it. I might hire a lawyer, I might be able to borrow money from somebody to cover a debt, right? Poor and working people don't have that resilience. One emergency can just floor them forever. And the other is, um, our, I mentioned it before, our illusions about control Right? That there's an unpredictability because of that constant vulnerability to, to these kinds of catastrophes that's different. And it's extreme and difficult way to live. There are no bootstraps. I think if you study this, you will find out you are not getting out of poverty by raising your own bootstraps. They don't exist. This is a trap. This thing, this thing we're talking about today is a trap. They'll trap middle class folks, and Fadel has a great story about how he was trapped, right? But he has some resilience, right? But they trap poor and working class people, and there's no way out except further into the trap. They like to blame people that they're lazy or uneducated or all these other adjectives. It doesn't matter. It's a trap, right? And we need to do something about that. It violates my expectations of what a system, a society needs to be. So, the think tank is here to raise this issue because it's invisible, right? We want people to hear these stories. We want your participation to change. The system will not change. The banks that run this game are powerful. Wells Fargo, Bank of America, they're powerful. They will not be changed except by, by a broad coalition of classes, races, and people, and we need to build that. So with that, I'm going to stop and call up our first testifier. Is that my job? Call people? Yeah. So um, I want to ask Chris. Chris is writing his life story there. Are you ready, Chris? 
But so Chris is a think tanker, uh, one of our uh, organizers, and he happens to work here at Denison. So he wants to tell you a couple stories about the track. Um, first, I'd like to say I'm a returning citizen who uh, paid my debt to society, um, did four and a half years, come out, was given three, three years of parole. Uh, I, did, I did every bit of that. And about a week ago, I got a bill for like 640 bucks in the mail saying that I owe this to the Ohio uh, Attorney General for parole. Um, do you know how hard that is? Coming out, we come out to nothing. We are starting from the ground and building our way up. A lot of us don't make it, we go back. Um, A lot of us end up back in active addiction, homelessness. Um, I myself have been there more than once. Um, but for uh, that to happen, it really upset me. For one, I work my butt off. I provide for my son. I was trying to take care of myself, build a life, um, and here I am getting a letter from parole. How do I owe them anything? I paid them, is what I told myself. You know, they called a supervision fee. What they supervise? They make us drive. They're making people drive clear to uh, was it Franklin County now? Is it still Lincoln County or Franklin County? Just to see to make them see them to report, but they're charging us this money. Doesn't make sense to me. Um, let's move on from that. Um, the second thing is, uh, as I said, I got out. Um, I hadn't had visitations with my son. Uh, wasn't able to see him at all. Didn't know if I was going to be able to. I had talked to him on the phone, told him, I said, make that a Christmas list. I'll make sure I get everything on that list and I'll take it to your grandmother's. Um, got a PlayStation 4 on this list. Uh, I went to go, I got everything on the list. Last thing was that PlayStation 4, and I was like $150 short. Uh, around Christmas time, a lot of people uh, don't have that kind of money. Uh, so I went to a rent to own place. Uh, struggle paying that sometimes. I think I had to borrow some money off a good old friend Alan. At least a few times, but um, but I kept my word um, to him, and that's what mattered to me. But at the same time, these guys are calling me every time I go in to pay the bill. They go, "Oh yeah, you want something else? We got a nice TV over here. We got a nice couch. And got you know, and I'm here. I am struggling to pay this bill." Um, finally, uh, I, I paid it off. I ended up paying. It was like a five hundred dollar thing to go to the store and get them what five hundred bucks. I probably paid almost two thousand um, dollars. I had to block them from my phone because they kept calling me after I paid everything, paid it off. They kept calling and calling and calling, trying to get me to come back in. Um, I blocked them. Now they send me mail. With that, thank you. I'm done. <laughs> Most of us take buying our children Christmas presents for granted, right? It's a different, different situation for a returning citizen or somebody in poverty. That's the definition of class privilege right there. Um, I want to invite Eleanor Shanklin up, a longtime resident of Newark and participant in the think tank. Eleanor, tell us your story. Hi, my name is Eleanor Shanklin, and I'm um, uh, I, too, am a returning citizen. <clears throat> My felony is uh, 21 years old, but it still sometimes reaps um, its ugly head. And that comes with, like, jobs. So, you know, a lot of times you can only get jobs in fast food places. 
And at the time, I was living with my daughter, and being a lioness that I am, when she's in trouble, I try to go to her rescue. And so I went to a cash advance place <clears throat> and borrowed, uh, I think the first time, I think they gave me $100. And you have a week, you pay it back, whatever, the next month or the next week or whatever. Paid that back. And uh, then they uh, extend you, you know, you get $200 this time. So I went for the $200. Uh, but at that time, um, I suffered a heart attack. And so I wasn't able to work and I lost my job and could no longer work. And uh, I really had forgot about uh, the money because I wasn't really that concerned. I was more concerned about my health or whatever. Uh, but they had sent me a letter, so I contacted them and told them that I was, you know, had had a heart attack and I wasn't able to work or anything. And so, didn't hear from them for a while. And then when I did hear from them, the $200 turned into about 600 and some dollars from the interest that was, uh, that accumulated. And so I had told them, well, you know, um, I can make payments. Uh, they told me I couldn't make payments. I had to pay it all off at once. That was not allowed to make payments. So I told them, I said, well, if I was able to pay it off, I would do so. I said, but I can't. And so now it's uh, with the other bills in the credit bureau as, as you know, we speak, but it's just not fair. If I'd have been able to make payments, I would have been able to pay them, but they won't take payments, which I thought was... Uh, really kind of stupid because any money should be better than no money. My other experience was um, with the title loan place. Once again, I'm the lioness. I'm coming to my daughter's rescue. And so we had uh, went to the title loan place. My brother had passed and had left a car. And um, so we got a loan on it. And I think it was something like uh, $800. Uh, and we were to pay so much each each month, and uh, I think something like $200 or something like that. And uh, so I missed one payment, and I told the gentleman that would be in the next week to uh, make the payment. Well, he came to the door and had brought me a letter, and asked, but by the time he left, my niece called me and said, Eleanor, they just came and got Brent's car. Well, they never even let me know that they had even came and gotten the car, was going to get the car. They just came and got the car. They gave me not a chance to, to do anything. And we go to these places because a credit is not that great or it's an emergency and it's easy access. And they know that and they prey upon people. And I think it's so sad that, um, that they're allowed to stay in business. You know, uh, something should be done about them, but it, it's really sad. And that's my story. <laughs> care of your family, taking care of your extended family is a different thing depending on what class you're in. Uh, I want to call up uh, Chuck Cooper, been a member of the Think Tank since the very beginning, and uh, Chuck is one of those, is a poster child against the dominant narrative, which is that people in this situation are shiftless, lazy, joint addicts, blah, 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 right, all that. Chuck works himself to death and works every single opportunity that he can. And that's, that's true of his family as well. And it's just such great experience to come into contact with because it puts the lie to that narrative that you hear so often about working in poor people. So, Chuck. Now, my story is different than some of the ones you've heard probably here, but not that much. Yes, I work, as that was said, but you're always that one notch below. You're, you're, you're rarely making much above minimum wage. It's never enough to pay the bills. You're always, you know, a dollar short and a day late. That's how I got involved with the infamous payday loans, title loan for a car. Uh, the plant I'd worked for for almost 13 years had shut down. I was forced into working at Harry and David as a seasonal employee. We needed help on a water bill. You can't go to the bank. My credit is no good. That's my fault. But you can't go to the bank and borrow $100. 
Sometimes you can go to family or friends. I went there. It seemed like a grand idea. Well, first off, they won't lend you 100. Minimum's 200. I allowed them to talk me into borrowing 300. Foolish on my part, but I thought I could do it. Unfortunately, if you're working as a seasonal employee, three days later I was laid off. How do you pay back? Consequently, the payments racked up, racked up. They came and got the car to salvage the car would have cost me over $1,000. Plus the, the fee for the towing, the storage. And backtracking, I'd said I got $300. They still get you because they write you a check that they charge you for that you have to take to Walmart and still pay to get the check cashed. So you're not even getting the 300. Yes, they see me coming. Yes, I knew better. But desperation leads you to be there. I thought I could do it. They do paint a pretty picture. Unfortunately, sometimes life can get in the way of that. Uh, and I dealt with payday lenders before. Went back for the payday loans back in those days, but I cleared myself of those. I was able to pay them off. They'd actually garnish my wages. That's how I got them paid off and out of my out of my hair. Uh, these people wield too much power, they, they, and they're, they they make it so easy. You know, it, I, I don't know how to break that bond. I don't know. Not everybody has good credit. I've tried. They, over the years, it's just gotten past me. You know, but we continue to try. I mean, you know, hopefully, maybe through these forums, we can get the message across that these people might serve a purpose, but their the bigger purpose is what they're serving themselves. You know, it, the charts down now, but. You know, 591 percent, that's outlandish, that's outlandish. Thank you. John Fisher, the head of Job and Family Services in Licking County, often points out that 80 percent of the people who get public assistance in Licking County are working. We should ask, uh, you know, cause us to ask ourselves, why are people who are working still below the poverty line so that they qualify for public assistance? The system is broken. Um, lastly, I'd like to bring up uh, Donna Gibson, who has not only lived in poverty, but she's a social service provider helping other people manage this situation. Um, so she's seen it from that. No, Josh is here as a reporter. This is. Josh Gingras, who is, uh, who is the editor of our newspaper, Justice, and anybody would like to see a copy of that, I have a few, not enough for everybody. But uh, Donna, Donna's going to talk to us about her experience from seeing this situation from both worlds, both her own and as a social service provider. Thank you for allowing me to come here. Um, I could give you more stories than you could handle to take home. Um, it's understanding, like Alan talks about the bootstraps, or somebody says, walk a mile in my shoe. I'm just going to tell you that I've seen people say, well, sure, I'll try on their shoes. And they say, ouch, I'm not doing that. And that's what happens. And the problem with these payday lenders and these auto loans is there's so many of them, it's like taking a photo and putting them on every corner. If you go into Newark, you'll see Church, Speedway, Duke and Duchess. Um, you'll see a payday lender and you'll see a bondsman. I mean, it's almost a repeat when you drive around the block. There's no getting lost. And they make it so convenient that way because a lot of our people do not have vehicles. They have to walk. So if you have to walk, and especially, it's like, what, what comes first, 
Ill, health issues or poverty? Does poverty lead to health issues or do health issues lead to poverty? It's the chicken and the egg. So here, a lot of these people have health issues, and so they're trying to get to the closest place, and you have a welcoming smile at the door as soon as you walk in. Hey, how you doing? Let me tell you exactly how you could pay this money back I'm about to give you. And you're in such a panic mode, you buy it. Oh, okay. And then when you get home, you think, oh, I can't do that. I can't afford that. Let's see, which one of my kids is not going to eat this week? Uh, I'm not going to get laundry done. But as a community, as, uh, as a state of Ohio being the worst in the country, that embarrasses me to be an Ohio resident and know that. But we help endorse that. We encourage that, apparently, because we all of a sudden we don't have enough payday lenders. Let's put another one in. And then we'll hire somebody to come in for minimum wage, and I'll give you a bonus for every person that you talk into not only getting this loan, but when they come back crying that they can't pay this loan, you make sure you give them the car to the person just up the road who will give us our money, and now they owe them. Pretty soon, they lose their home, or they lose their vehicle because they come and take it. Now they're in shelter, now they have children, children's services is involved. So it, it's a domino effect, and I've watched so many of my people even commit crimes, not because they wanted to, but because they felt they had to. Well, now they have a felony. So now their employment is affected. It's just a vicious cycle that I see it time and time again, and Part of what I do in the community is I try to get people to slow down a little bit. This guy's got a great smile, he's got a check for you, but that check is not the catch-all end-all. I want to get you to slow down, take a breath, and let's talk about what we can do. How many of you guys have had been in panic mode and made really bad decisions? This is what happens with people who are in poverty settings or who don't have a car, who have to walk everywhere, and stuck dealing with these uh, organizations that are out there. It's panic mode. You just solved my problem. I go down the road, you just solved my problem. And when they get home, now they have 14 additional problems. So I call on not only uh, our community, but you guys who are students, you are our future. I'm 53 years old, so I, I got a lot of life left in me, and I imagine I'll have a wheelie at some point that I'm still going to get around the community. But you guys need to be our voices, and you need to be the voice of action, and you need to be able to say, hey, we don't have a problem with you making money, but let's stop making money off the backs of people who are struggling. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna call a couple of people who uh, join us for the session today to to start the, the conversation. I'm gonna start with maybe Wendy uh, to tell us about the petition that's relating to the payday loan. So um, my name is Wendy Tarr. I'm also with the Think Tank on Poverty, and um, there's a coalition this is here in Ohio, the Ohio uh, Payday Lending Coalition. Um, and there's a number of different groups that are working to address this issue. Um, there's, like Bob said, um, a bill in the House, House Bill 123. Um, but there's also been some stall. Um, we've attempted in Ohio to pass legislation um, bipartisan through the State House um, and have been ineffective. Um, unable to do that um, a number of years in a row. And so um, that coalition is actually in the process of uh, collecting petitions in order to put that language on the ballot as a constitutional amendment um, where voters of Ohio could potentially, if there was enough signatures collected, would have the opportunity to vote um, on these types of changes. 
And I, I don't, I know you guys will have an opportunity to look into that a little bit more in your classroom, what all of that entails, um, just to educate yourself and consider what that might mean for you. Um, but that's just something we want to make you aware of. Um, and it wouldn't really end all of the payday lending in Ohio. That's not the uh, intention of the language or what they're attempting to do, but it would scale back the amount of interest that would be legally allowed to be charged, and it would set a different set of rules that a lender would have to operate by when they have a customer coming in and seeking a loan um, to where they would have to have a reasonable uh, you know, a reasonable set of standards that they would utilize before lending out money. So that's what I have for you just as, by way of education um, and wanted to make sure people were right. Thank you. And I'm going to ask uh, Deb also to tell us a little bit about the work that's, uh, that's happening around the state and especially in Columbus uh, in terms of uh, you know, scaling back the payday lending uh, power in, in the state of Ohio. <laughs> First, um, I'm Deb Zemladil, and I'm involved with the Newark Think Tank on Poverty and with the Society of St. Vincent de Paul. Um, many of you may or may not know about that, but it's a, a religious organization that does charity work and justice work. So by the charity work, what we do is when someone calls us for help, someone who lives in poverty, we go visit them in their home to find out what they need. Um, and we talk to them. Sometimes we find out they need things other than what they said they needed. And then, once we find out what they need, we do what we can to help them out with either cash assistance or some other form of, of support. A lot of times what we find out from those visits are there are some repetitive issues that are causing some of the problems that, that the people we're serving have. One of those repetitive issues has been predatory lending. And because of that, across the United States, a lot of um, St. Vincent de Paul councils in a lot of the major cities in the United States have started what we call microloan programs. Now, these aren't microloan programs to start businesses, which might be the way you've typically heard of the term microloan. But what these societies are doing is making loans, low interest loans, to people who don't have access to regular banking. So we're, what we're trying to do on a small scale is take the place of predatory lenders for the people that we serve. We will never be a storefront operation. We just don't have enough money to be able to do that or the staff or the insurance. But what we're trying to do person by person, step by step, is to make a difference in the lives of some people. Um, here in the Columbus Diocese, which is 22 counties in central and southern Ohio, we have started a microloan program. Well, what we do is we make small dollar loans for 3% interest, and at the successful completion of paying back the loan, we give the person that 3% interest back. Now, the credit union doesn't give them the money back. The society gives them the money back. We partner with credit unions on a county-by-county -county basis, pretty much because that's the way credit unions are set up here in Ohio. So right now, in Licking County, we've been operational for a little over a year and a half. We started out by making four types of loans. We, um, those loans had to be for car repair, house repair, educational expenses, and medical expenses that were not written down by a hospital, doctor, or covered by insurance. So that's where we started. For the first year, we had, I think, two defaults out of, I want to say about 12 loans. So that's not a bad percentage, that's 20%. Nationally, when you make loans to people with the lower credit scores, they tend, those defaults tend to be 28 to 35%, depending on, um, de depending on what area and how low the credit scores are and the credit history is. Um, every person who takes out a loan with us gets a financial mentor or two financial mentors because we do everything in twos um, so that we create a sense of community. So what we are trying to do by offering financial mentorship is also to let the person know that they're not alone, that there's a community that wants to support them. And we talk about financial empowerment issues. It's not for us to tell somebody how to budget money because I will tell you the people we work with are much better at budgeting their money than we are. 
I have extra disposable income, so I waste my money more than someone who lives in poverty and wastes their money. They can teach me. But together, what we can do is learn how the financial system works. And then once we learn how the financial system works, we can make better decisions. We have started a loan program now in Ross County, right down in, in the Appalachian area. They've made their first loan for $300 for car repair. We will be starting making loans in Franklin County very soon. The bigger the county, the harder they are to start. I will tell you that right now. We're also getting ready to start in Delaware County and Fairfield County. So we will have in our area the five probably largest population areas of our diocese, and we'll have a pretty good number of people, and hopefully we can spread a little bit further than that. The person must have an ability to repay. We will not give a loan to somebody that we don't think will have an ability to repay. We can't always make the, the correct judgment on that, which is why we do occasionally have defaults. But the reason we do that is we want the person to be successful and not have another one of those um, negative situations arise. The worst thing for us to do would be to loan money to someone and have them not be able to pay it back and hurt their credit score. Because credit scores are used for employment, they're used for additional loans, and we don't want to cause any more problems than that. We don't loan out more than $500, although each loan program in every county is run by a local board of people from the community, and they can make a decision to go up to $750 if necessary. In Lincoln County, we are testing two new types of loans because they've had a successful first year. We are now, um, we've made a loan to one person to help that person pay off a payday loan. And um, the, the length of time it's going to take for the person to pay it back, because it's closer to $700, is going to take a little bit longer. So that person has two financial mentors. I think we're in the second or third month of that. If it goes well here in Lincoln County, the other counties will be able to start making loans like that. Then we will also, although we haven't done it yet, is if someone needs help, not with rent and not with utilities, but with a security deposit if they're going in for a new apartment, we are going to test three security deposit loans. Why are we so careful? Well, one of the things you have to understand when you're a community organiza organization like we are, we are getting the money to do this from donors, so we have to be good stewards of our donors' money. We have a relationship with four different credit unions in our five different counties. We have to be good stewards of our relationships with the credit unions. And we have to be good stewards of the people we loan the money to because we don't want them to fail. And we have to be a good steward for our own organization. And so it's important for us to be very cautious so that we learn how to do this right in the best way we can because the last thing we want to do is make someone's life more difficult who's already struggling. And so I think I'll stop there. I just want you to know that there are people out there who are trying to offer an alternative. I just wish we could be big enough to wipe out the whole industry, but we can't. Thank you. So one of the things that um, I love about the think tank, and in terms of the way I also introduce these things in, in my classes, is the, the focus is on the structural root cause issue is not just on the Band-Aid solutions. Band-Aid solutions are important and necessary. When somebody's hungry, we gotta feed them. When somebody's homeless, we gotta you know, solve that problem. But it doesn't take care of this. The numbers don't add up. Look at every county in the country. If you live you know, on minimum wage, a little bit above minimum wage, it doesn't add up. The cost of living is just too high. So this is, and if you're, you know, if you have good credit score, if you're, you know, privileged, you're in the middle class sort of uh, status, then we, I can show you the numbers for consumer debt, household debt. Then you have access to traditional loans from banks, mortgages and car loans at, you know, reasonable interest rates. But that's debt that's been accumulated for, for households. If you don't qualify for those traditional, if you're the unbanked or underbanked, that's the population we're talking about, 90 million people, close to 90 million people, these are the only options. So we can, we can ban predatory lending today, and the problem would go away. How do people pay their bills, right, if there's no other alternative? So we can you know, come up with temporary solutions that, that really work, get people away from the debt trap of predatory lending, 
but it doesn't solve the problem in the long run. So that's, that's the part of the conversation that we need to pay attention to. And I'm inviting my class and the think tank to think about you know, the short-term solutions. How do we handle the crisis? And then think long-term about how do we structurally end this thing? I mean, a few years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine who's very into you know, social entrepreneurship type of issues. And he said, I don't want to help the homeless shelter. I want to drive it out of business in a good way. Right? And this is really the kind of attitude that we need to, to follow, driving this out of business completely in a good way, where we can have decent jobs and decent wages that allow people to step away from these kinds of predatory lending scenarios. So in, in this class, one of the things that we'll explore uh, with the think tank, because um, this is a national issue, um, and Chuck and I are, are meeting next week to talk about uh, state banks as an alternative to, you know, the traditional banking system. Um, at the national level, there's discussions about the post office acting as a bank. Postal banking is, is a thing in most other countries, right? Uh, so you don't have to cash a check at Walmart and pay, you know, a third of your paycheck just to cash your own money, right? Postal banking is sort of a public service, and it's a payment system. So there's all of these proposals in the, in the USPS at the highest level. They, they drafted a major study, major study, major document saying, we can do it. We have the resources. We're in every single corner of the country. And we can serve communities that are underbanked or unbanked in a much more effective way than, than this. When we have you know, payday lenders in every other corner, as, as you said, way more than McDonald stores, we have a problem. McDonald is a problem. <laughs> But this is a bigger problem than, than the you know, fast food and food deserts and all kinds of things. So this is really where I wanted to start the conversation. This is our first meeting, so we wanted this to be a way for us to explore you know, the national trends and the bigger issues, structural issues, and also hear you know, personal stories from our own community, and there are many more in this community and beyond. Uh, as Alan said, I. I almost got trapped into one of these, and I, I know this stuff. And I just couldn't believe how aggressive these people can be, and how sneaky they can be about the, the fees and the late fees, and they, they tell you to pay online, and then they make sure that the website doesn't work, and then you miss the payment, and they say, well, it's too late now, you're, you're trapped. Um, but I guess at some point they Googled my name and said, well, this, we can't really handle this guy, so they let me go. But they, they have very, they're trained to do this. They're trained to prey on people. So it's, and it's a systemic thing. It's not just a, a couple of bad apples here and there. This is part of the culture of the industry. And it is an industry, it's a major industry. And when you think of the payday lending, you think these are small local companies, storefronts. If you read some of the contracts when you actually sign the deal, and you read the fine print, many of those companies are owned by Bank of America and Chase and JP Morgan and all the big banks, they just don't put their you know, fancy labels on the stores. But it's, it's part of the, the big you know, national industry. So, so with that, I'll, I'll open it up for, for comments and questions from, from the audience. I know we have 1.30 is our cutoff time to, to move on to classes and other things. But uh, there are microphones uh, around the tables. Uh, so please uh, join us if you have any questions, comments, stories to share. Or if you have questions for Wendy or Deb, or uh, questions about the, the think tank, the work of the think tank as well. Sorry, that's, oh, yes, Do you know how many of these, how many uh, of these storefronts are in operation in Lincoln County? I think that's one of the things we're going to survey in this class. <laughs> we know the total number in, in the state of Ohio, which is 650. Um, but we'll, we'll find out. We'll, that's one of the things we're going to try to map, you know, maybe actually do a map with GPS locations. I, I have no idea, but I, you know, just driving down, you know, the main, you know, uh, strip balls, you, you can count them. And it's not just the payday lending. So this is the other thing I wanted to explore this semester with the class. 
is the different kinds of predatory lending. Payday lending is one of those, like the fast cash places or whatever they call them. There's also the online predatory lending, which is national phenomenon. Um, there's also the, the rent to own lending schemes. There's the, the title loan lending schemes. There's the, the car, you know, the buying a car under certain terms and conditions. Um, so we're trying to catalog the different kinds of lending schemes uh, that happen in, in this county in particular. And as I said, the policy report that we're hoping to produce at the end of the semester will, will catalog all of these <coughs> categories, talk about the bigger structural issues, national trends, and, and lay out some possibilities for long-term solutions, which may include state banks, postal banks, you know, different kinds of microloans, and then addressing the, the living wage kind of uh, situation to, to eliminate the need for this kind of predatory lending. Yeah. Other questions from the students or the audience? Yes, please. Yes, hi, my name is Suparna Bhaskaran, and I'm visiting uh, here. Uh, Fado invited me here. Um, I am a researcher uh, at the Haas Institute uh, at UC Berkeley. Um, my question um, is either to the students or anyone in the room. Um, folks mentioned that Ohio really stands out um, in terms of the number of uh, the practices as worst practices. Um, can, can anyone, does anyone have an idea of how uh, some of the other states fare, like who are, who've actually pushed, have moved beyond some of these worst practices? And, you know, what are some of the things that they've done to move away from some of this? Good question to research this semester, right? So, uh, I don't know if anybody wants to speak to that, but my you know vague understanding of this is that there are some states that work pretty aggressively to pass laws sort of either capping interest rates or banning predatory lending completely uh, some states well some predatory lenders lenders like in ohio because in ohio we do have predatory lending laws that cap it at 28 percent but they manage to you know retool themselves into different uh, institutions and keep doing what they're doing at, at high interest rates. The other uh, issue is that states who escape, or who uh, ban predatory lending or you know cap predatory lending activity, and then can't really deal with the online predatory lending, which comes from out of state or comes from um, uh, payday lending institutions that are technically uh, incorporated or based in. Um, within Indian tribes, uh, and as a result, can't really be touched by states. Um, there's there's some cases of, of that uh, in in Kansas City. Um, there's uh, some of you have seen the episode of uh, Dirty Money on Netflix, which is the second episode is on pay payday lending, and they talk about this particular case of the fast cash place or whatever that was you know hiding legally within. Uh, uh, within the state, within Indian territory, and doing it's uh, it, it, from Oklahoma and then lending across the country, right? Uh, so there, are, it's 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 a it's a tricky situation. Um, it's uh, somebody described it as a game of whack-a-mole. You know, you hit it on this side, it comes out on the other side. Wendy, you wanted to speak to that. I'm, I am um, not an expert in this in any way, but. Uh, I know that what you just said about the whack a mole, and, and I probably should make a clarification of what I said earlier, because we did pass law in Ohio in 2008 um, that was favored by the voters two to one, but that kind of curbed payday lending and kind of stopped some of this for a short period of time, but then the industry uh, found a loophole in the language of the law that would allow them to kind of reconfigure how they offer those loans um, I think they kind of categorize them as home buyer loans or something. It was something that was very deceptive, but it was legally a loophole that they could exploit. And so they'd come back, which is part of what we're continuing to struggle with. And I think that the um, changes that are being proposed are based off of changes that other states have done. So Colorado is one of the, I believe, one of the more 
you know, examples of that where they have like the short-term two-week loans that if you don't pay it off in two weeks, then the interest goes way up. And so what they did was they made that illegal and you had to have loans that are a lower interest rate to pay off over six months. And that's changed, you know, to where a loan that a person has in Colorado is like 4% of their income versus, uh, I, I'm sorry, 4% of what they're paying. Uh, check is versus you know what happens here where it just all of a sudden catches you because you can't you know necessarily pay it right off so um, there are some of those studies and I'm sure your class will have an opportunity to look at that but that's just one short answer yeah. I was just gonna say if you take a look at the Pew charitable trust work that's what the Ohio law was based off of. And um, the law that was passed in 2008, there are no longer any payday lenders that fall under the classification of that original law from 2008. And that's how they can get around it. The law was one specific classification. From what I understand, House Bill 123 would go across classifications so that no one could move from one classification to another now. Um, and I have this chart. I, I only have one of them with me today, but it shows that Colorado's interest rate is now down to around 214 percent, and that's based on an average $300 loan for a two-week period of time. Um, I think it's available from the Center for Responsible Lending. So, uh, um, you know, if you're interested in getting that, you, you can. It, but it also highlights which states have passed laws either banning or putting an interest rate cap on um, payday lenders, and it shows the ones that don't have any. So I'll, I have it here if you want to take a look. I'll, I'll leave it on the table. You know, before I leave, you can take a look. Yo. Know, the, uh, uh, probably the, the bottom line on these predator, predatory lendings, payday loans, so forth, There'll always be the need. The people will always have that. My electric's going to be shut off in the morning. I need 150. I need 200 dollars. Until that access is able to, because you'll you'll scrabble. You'll do whatever you got to do. It doesn't matter how, what kind of picture they paint. If you've got the money in hand, you'll sign the paper. If that's what it takes to keep the water flowing, keep the lights on, keep the kids fed. I, I don't know exactly how to smooth the problem over to get past it. I don't have those answers, but there has to be an answer. My question that I was going to present, how is it that Ohio seems to be the bastion for all the, all the sharks to, to school here? Everybody else had to have came across these problems already. Why can't we follow the suit and get rid of them? I don't know the, the answer to that question, but I just want to raise a word with you. And that word is unacceptable. 200%, the big reform in Colorado, 200% interest, unacceptable. Not acceptable to me. I mean, come on. You spend, what, you, what is it, 18% on your credit card? You know, 200% is unacceptable. Let's really fix this and quit screwing around. It's poverty we're talking about. It's unemployment. It's underemployment. 80% of the people in this county who get public assistance are working. Let's keep our eyes on the prize. What are the things, and I just want to say, in terms of keeping our eyes on the prize, and like Fadl said, Band-Aids are important because we need to keep people alive while they're fighting. But we need to keep our eyes on the prize. And um, whatever I was going to say just flipped right out of my mind. Um, <laughs> jobs, jobs, jobs. Uh, good, good paying jobs with benefits, the ones you would want for yourselves. That, that phrase, at least they have a job, get it out of your vocabulary. It's part of the dominant narrative, right? We need to do that. We need to pay attention. Oh, here's what I was going to say. Here's the other thing you need to think about, the free market economy. Now, 
Fadl would argue with me about whether there is even a thing such as the free market economy, but it's part of our national religion that there is, right? There's at least one party and maybe two that believes in the free market. That means, and I'm interpreting what's happening in Washington right now, that anything that impedes business, and we've all been talking about regulation of business, is wrong. So look what they've done to the Com Consumer Protection Bureau, you know, the EPA, all of those other th uh, agencies that are there for regulation are being gutted because they impede business. But there are other values besides business. And there are other returns on investment besides 10%. There's 9%, there's 8%, which is still return, right? So we need to pay attention to the big picture as well. People need to vote. Where people need to organize other people to vote. Stop being apathetic about politics because the high priest of the free market is holding court in Washington, D.C. and is picking all the heads of the agencies and is enshrining that not only as the national religion, but as the national way to go, which means more poverty, not less, more. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we talked about is uh, the Band-Aid effect. And we do need the Band-Aid effect. I mean, we have to keep helping people who are in the struggles. But more importantly, we need to start educating our community members when they're little to, 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 to know what to do before they get into the panic mode, before they uh, get into the struggle, to be able to make decisions. And that starts when people are young. It's the tyranny of the moment, which bridges out of poverty. I'm a trainer. And it just seems to do this. Boom. Because I don't know any better. That's what mom did. That's what dad did. So until we put a hiccup in that and we start educating our community members more, not assuming, well, you're poor, so you probably wouldn't be a good candidate for college. Let's go over here to this middle class student. We need to stop doing that, too. We start educating all of our kids that there are certain things that are not the answer. You know, that's true, but I, can, I, I know that in my situation, I was raised uh, to make good decisions, but somewhere along the line that I fell away from that. And I have, my cash advance must be everywhere because they call me three times a week telling me i am been approved for a loan up to $5,000. Okay, on a good day, on a bad day, that sounds real good, you know, and I might fall for that. I had a friend that was dealing with two payday lenders, so the one was so greedy, they paid the other one off because they wanted her to deal just with them. See, this is how they, they rake you in. I mean, you know, they just, they prey on you. They're, they're worse than sexual predators, you know, and, and that's, that's where it comes in because they know, it seems like they know when to call you, you know, uh, like they, they got up camera on you knowing you know about your situation and it's it's just not you know something that yep. um we're, we're getting close to 1 30 uh, and i know some of you have to go to uh other classes and uh, other commitments um this is the beginning of the conversation i'm really grateful for for uh, members of the think tank for sharing their stories and engaging with us and for everybody else who joined us from Columbus and beyond. Um, if you have additional ideas, questions, thoughts, please feel free to uh, email me those ideas. We're going to share them with the class. Um, the class will move to Higley now with a few members of the think tank to join us to brainstorm next steps for the research project. So I invite anybody else who'd like to jo join us in that particular brainstorming session. We're going to be in Higley 413 uh, upstairs. Um, but if there are any other ideas, please share them with me by, by email or resources or, or anything else. I want to thank again um, Ohio Campus Compact for making this possible, the Econ Department for making this event possible, and uh, ITS Food Services for and FizzPlan for bringing the microphones and the cameras, and, and HI for filming the, the event, which will be available online. So those of you who spoke publicly today, these are the rules of the university, there is a form, a release form, that allows us to use the recorded stuff and make it available for everybody else. 
So if you spoke, if you could please find me and sign the form, that would be great. If you don't sign the form, we'll figure out a way to edit you out of the video and put it online. So uh, with that, thanks again, and hope to see you soon. Thanks.